Depersonalization and derealization are a combination of symptoms in which you feel detached or have a dreamlike experience that includes unusual reactions to yourself and to your surroundings. Now, people describe these experiences as feeling outside of their body or feeling as if everything is distorted or foggy, clouded, or unreal. Depersonalization is the feeling of unreality and detachment from the sense of yourself, your emotions, your thoughts, your memories, and your physical sensations. Derealization is the sense of unreality and detachment from the external world. Now I'm going to review what DPDR is, how you get it, and most importantly, how you treat it. You will especially want to watch the part where I share what helped Billy in his recovery near the end. Now, some of the information I share in this video is from a book called Overcoming Depersonalization and Feelings of Unreality, Second Edition by Hunter Baker, Lawrence, and David. Most people experience both depersonalization and derealization at the same time, and this is why we refer to it as DPDR, but it is possible to experience one or the other as well. What makes the condition different than other mental health conditions is that there's this disconnect or this cut-off feeling along with other feelings of unreality. Now, this can be a very frightening experience for people because they often fear that they might even develop a worse condition or, or go insane, or, you know, even though there's absolutely no evidence for that. Now, people have unique ways of describing DPDR, and they often use metaphors, like they feel like they're inside a bubble, or they're in a dream, or they're viewing the world behind a glass, and they just don't feel the same connection with themselves or others around them. Now, it's also common that people feel a certain emotional numbing, um, and this can affect both positive and negative emotions. And they feel that their actions are more robotic-like sometimes, or they're spectators and they're on autopilot as they move through their day. People also describe a cognitive numbing, and they use the phrase brain fog to describe you know, how it's difficult to concentrate and, and get their tasks completed. But their symptoms are internal to them. They're really not noticeable by other people. Now, DPDR can occur alone on its own, or it can occur in combination with other mental health conditions. So people with DPDR can experience high levels of anxiety, including panic attacks. They can have intrusive thoughts, uh, fear of being alone, and intense anxiety in social situations. DPDR is surprisingly common. One study found that over 70% of people reported to have DPDR at some point in their life, although severe DPDR is much less common and is about estimated at about 2% of the population, similar numbers to what we see with OCD. Now, it's more common in young adults rather than older adults, and equal numbers of males and females seem to get DPDR. Now, there seems to be three main ways that symptoms of DPDR start. Number one, there can be a sudden onset. One day, it just begins. Number two, the symptoms can begin in very short inter intervals that can become longer or happen more frequently. And number three, there are some people that report that they've always experienced symptoms of DPDR. Now, slightly over 70% of people experience both uh, depersonalization and derealization symptoms together, while around a little over 20% have depersonalization and a bit over 5% have derealization. So let's talk about the causes of DPDR. Now, it's believed that DPDR is a response that's triggered in situations that are perceived by the person to be overwhelming, threatening, and inescapable. It can happen in response to a sudden event, like a bad drug experience, or a panic attack, or a traumatic event. And it can build up over time as events accumulate. 
I'm sure you've heard of your anxiety or fear response referred to as fight or flight where you have an immediate release of adrenaline and other hormones in order to give you the energy to run or fight off an attacker. Now there's a third response to fight or flight that's called the freeze response. And this is, you know, what is happening when animals like possums play dead. Well, humans can freeze up as well. And some theorists believe that DPDR is a part of this freeze response. Now, DPDR is thought to be an innate protection or survival mechanism. So in other words, we have it built into us. If our brain believes that we're in enough danger and threatened, it tries to protect us by blunting or disconnecting us from our experience. Brain imaging studies have actually shown that people with depersonalization do not show the usual level of brain activity in their limbic system. That's the emotional center of the brain when they're shown distressing images. So it does appear that there's a numbing or disconnection that happens. Now, I've heard various metaphors comparing DPDR to an electrical system that gets overloaded and eventually the fuse blows and the electrical connection cuts off as a safety protection mechanism. Now humans have that same disconnection mechanism. Research, researchers believe that functionally, it's only meant to be this very short acting, you know, action uh, and only lasting during the threat. But unfortunately for some, it's not short acting and it takes much longer to resolve. Now it's theorized that people have described, you know, always having symptoms of DPDR. And it's, it's believed that possibly their trauma, uh, when maybe when they were younger, they developed a habitual way to respond to the stress. And people that have chronic DPDR may experience symptoms for the same reasons that people that struggle from panic disorder. They have intensely fearful of their symptoms and they try to avoid their triggering symptoms. So their own fearful thoughts and avoidance behaviors reinforce that fear. And they become so stressed and so worried about DPDR symptoms that they activate their fear center and they trigger the very symptoms of DPDR that they don't wanna have. So these conditions ultimately create a sense of dread and helplessness in people because they just don't know what to do to get better. So this is a good opportunity to talk about healing and the recovery process. I'm gonna share some information here, but if you would like more help and cover these details step by step, I cover it in my panic course that you can find at pagepradco.com. Now, because DPDR is your brain's go-to method of protecting you when you're anxious, afraid, stressed, exhausted, upset, or threatened, the symptoms will be triggered in those situations until your brain learns that you're safe. So how do you think that your brain learns that you're safe? Well, your brain learns implicitly through experiences and explicitly like listening to information like this. Now I use examples of learning, like learning how to drive or learning to play a video game. You can only learn so much by watching and listening. Eventually you have to jump in and experience it for yourself. Now your brain picks up clues through your emotions, your senses, um, your behaviors, your thoughts, all of it. So if you're experiencing DPDR symptoms and your response is, oh no, I hate this, oh, it's happening again. That kind of reaction will cause your brain to heighten your fear response and you will likely stay in that DPDR state longer. So instead, to help your brain to learn to feel safe, you want to allow the symptoms to be there. And you want to carry on as if they're not there, or they're not happening, or they're not bothering you. You're not concerned, you're unconcerned. Um, DPDR symptoms are uncomfortable, but they are not harmful or dangerous. 
So if you do things to immediately try to calm yourself down in an attempt to stop the symptoms, you're actually reinforcing that cycle and you're actually making it worse in the long run. So doing nothing but moving through your day as if the symptoms were not occurring is best. You know, have you ever noticed a smeared bug on your windshield? And if you focus on that bug, you know, it drives you crazy. It takes your attention and it gets more and more annoying that it's blocking your view. But if you look past the bug, you know it's there, but you're looking past it. You're able to focus your attention again on driving or on the scenery. This is the approach you want to use when you experience DPDR symptoms. The next step is to allow your brain to learn that you're safe through planned experiences. And we call those interoceptive exposures. You do exercises to mimic your DPDR symptoms on purpose, under your control, and you practice tolerating the symptoms. Now you may have heard me talk about ERP, exposure and response prevention, and the exposures for DPDR can include a combination of interoceptive exposures, imaginal exposures, scripts, and situational exposures. But let's talk about response prevention for a moment. Now most people that have DPDR avoid a bunch of activities and situations uh, that they fear might trigger their DPDR symptoms. We call those avoidance behaviors. And they're likely do a bunch of extra things to make themselves feel a little safer and more comfortable, like carrying around food or water or medicine or having someone with them at all times. We call those safety behaviors. By doing those avoidance and safety behaviors, you are unintentionally training your brain that DPDR symptoms must really be bad. They must really be dangerous. And that's a sure way to keep yourself in the DPDR cycle. So remember that as long as your brain is scared of DPDR symptoms, the symptoms and the cycle will continue because it's part of your built-in fear response. So while exposures are important for providing you experiential and implicit learning opportunities, equally important and possibly more important is the response prevention part. And that means to prevent any response to your anxiety or your discomfort. And in other words, you want to eliminate your avoidance and safety behaviors. Now, most people identify what they're doing and avoiding, and then gradually they're eliminating those avoidance behaviors first, and then their safety behaviors. You will want to practice response prevention before, during, and after your exposures. So in other words, you're always practicing response prevention to train your brain that you're not afraid of those DPDR symptoms. Now to treat panic disorder, you use the same strategies. You do certain interoceptive exercises to practice recreating or mimicking the very symptoms that scare you. And then you do nothing to calm yourself or soothe yourself. You practice and you get better at letting go of the resistance or the struggle and the tension. And this is how your brain learns experientially that you are safe. And then it has no need to go into DPDR. Now we do the same thing for DPDR exposures. There are several different interoceptive exposures for DPDR. In the book, Exposure Therapy for Anxiety, second edition by Abramowitz, Deacon, and Whiteside, there's an extensive list including exercises like spinning while sitting or standing at a rate of one rotation per second, um, for 60 seconds. Prolonged hyperventilating by taking rapid breaths at a rate of one breath every two seconds for 60 seconds or longer. Staring intently at oneself in a mirror for several minutes or staring at a small dot on the wall or staring at fluorescent lights. <clears throat> now I suggest keeping a journal of your daily exposures. You can practice your exposures in three trial increments with a few minute break in between each exercise. And then repeat the practice 
Um, maybe you want to practice one or two times a day or more if you'd like. Now one trial means that you complete the exercise for as long as you can tolerate it and then you rate your level of anxiety from 1 to 10. And then next, you rate the level of similarity from 1 to 10, meaning how similar your symptoms were during this exposure to other times when you've had DPDR symptoms. Now, in your daily exposure journal, keep track of each exposure you do and your ratings, and then write a little summary about what that was like, what do you think you learned while you were doing it. Again, all of these details are spelled out for you and tracking forms, and they're available in my panic course if you're interested. Now, as you get more confident in your abilities to tolerate the exposures, you can begin to mix it up and practice the exposures in different environments and even in combination while listening to scripts to keep your brain learning even more. I covered a lot of information here and it could feel a little overwhelming. So just start with something. Maybe you begin by working on allowing the symptoms to be there. Then maybe you start a daily exposure journal and begin just doing one exercise. Tolerate what you can tolerate. Maybe the first time you do it, you know, you do it five seconds and then you just build up from there. Take your time and when your tolerance ability improves, then do a little more. Try your best not to revert back to your safe places and your safe behaviors, trying to calm yourself after the exposures. The whole objective here is to train your brain that these experiences, through the experiences, you're safe. You're unconcerned, you can tolerate whatever symptoms there are, and you understand that DPDR symptoms are not harmful or dangerous. So let me share with you a part of an email from Billy a lovely person that suffers from DPDR and contacted me after seeing one of my videos. He gave me permission to share this with you. This is from Billy. One thing I wanted to share with you specifically, you introduced me to interoceptive exposure therapy for DPDR. I had never heard of this before you, and even the therapists I've worked with, some that do specialize in anxiety, and offer help with interoceptive exposure, have never used the method that you use for DPDR using the mirror. I've shared this exposure with so many people dealing with anxiety in the support groups that I've joined because that one exposure was huge in my recovery journey. It helped me so incredibly much and I would never have known about it had it not been for you. I realize we are all different and different things resonate more with different people, but I will forever believe that exposure therapy and all of those uncomfortable sessions of staring at myself in the mirror were the catalyst to me seeing a light at the end of the tunnel regarding my ability to recover from anxiety. I wanna thank Billy for his email and that he sent to me through the contact form on pagepradco.com. It means a lot to me to get that kind of feedback. I hope that this information was encouraging and helpful. Until next time, I'll see you in session. Take care. Bye-bye.